Hey everybody, in this video we are going to talk about DNA lesions. Uh, well, I am going to talk about DNA lesions. I don't know why I always say we. Uh, so what is a DNA lesion? Essentially, a DNA lesion is any, any type of DNA damage, any type of modification to the DNA, any change in the DNA that uh, makes it look uh, abnormal abnormal. So let me give you some examples. So an A basic site. So this would be a, a, a nucleotide that is missing the nitrogenous base. So an A basic site is a DNA lesion. A mismatch. So a mismatch. Uh, so let's say you you shouldn't be in DNA to begin with, but you paired with G, you know, that's a mismatch. That shouldn't be there. Uh, a paired with G, that, that's not right. T paired with G, that's not right either. Um, so those types of mismatches, you know, mismatches are lesions. Modified bases. And we're going to see some modified bases in a moment. Essentially, you know, taking, there are things that can happen in the cell. There are uh, carcinogenic molecules that can enter our cells and they can modify the bases. That means, you know, adding certain uh, molecules like a methyl group or other chemicals to the nitrogenous base. That's a modified base and that is considered a DNA lesion. That Those modified bases can do bad things. They can uh, block DNA replication. They can cause uh, pairing with the wrong base pair, which can lead to errors during DNA replication. So modified bases are DNA lesions. We also have nicks in the DNA backbone, double strand breaks, which we have talked a little bit about already. We also have interstrand and intrastrand crosslinks. Now, Inter, interstrand and intrastrand crosslinks. That's like uh, covalent bonds forming between the two strands of DNA. So let's say this is our DNA molecule right here, and these squares are the bases. And if we get bonds forming between these two strands here, or maybe they're like this, this is a conceptual diagram but covalent bonds forming between the two strands, that would be an intrastrand crosslink. Uh, intrastrand would be, you know, bonds forming, covalent bonds forming between uh, molecules within the strand, within a single strand. So these guys right here, these are also types of DNA lesions. So we can classify these in three different ways. So these would be these three up here, a basic sites, mismatches, modified bases, these are all base changes or DNA lesions uh, affecting bases. These, we can classify these as strand breaks. And uh, these, we'll characterize these as structural distortions. So, these guys down here will change the structure of the DNA so it doesn't quite twist as it normally does, for, it, for example. Um, so these are going to be examples of structural distortions. We can also have structural distortions when we have two purines paired together, right? So that's going to that's gonna cause some, some structural problems also. Um, okay, so this is just an overview of DNA lesions, and I just want you to see that DNA a DNA lesion is any change, any change to the DNA that, that results in something that is not normal. So in this video, we are mostly going to focus on uh, base changes. So what I want to look at first is a couple of, well, let's say right here. So on the left, I've diagrammed uh, the cytosine, nitrogenous base. So something that can happen quite commonly in, in cells is 
this right here, this this amino group right here, can be changed to this oxygen group right here, this aldehyde. I guess I'm gonna call this an aldehyde or ketone or something. Um, whatever, whatever, this can happen quite frequently in the cell. And what it does when that happens is it changes cytosine to uracil, right? Um, okay, so that will create a mismatch. Okay, so that's an example of how we can get a, uh, a mismatch and plus an example of how we can get uracil in DNA. So a couple of other things here. So here we have cytosine. Now there are some carcinogens. One of them is vinyl, chlor uh, vinyl chloride, I believe it's called. And vinyl chloride, what it can do is, uh, I think it's an industrial chemical, but what it does is it converts cytosine to uh, athenocytosine. And this is a modified base that needs to be removed from DNA. It can cause problems. Uh, with DNA replication and base pairing. Also guanine. So it can be modified by these things called reactive oxygen species, which just occur in, in our cells due to, um, well, their, their levels can be increased by uh, various environmental uh, chemicals, but also they're, they're just a natural result of cellu cellular processes sometimes. And guanine can be changed to a oxoguanine. And this can pair with T instead of C. So it can cause base changes during replication when, when 8-oxoguanine is in the DNA instead of guanine. So these are just a couple examples of modifications that can occur to bases. There are many, many, many types of modifications that can happen. And the purpose of, of this video isn't to focus on all those modifications and how they can occur, but uh, to focus on how they can be removed when they do occur. So let's take a quick look at this diagram that I put together. Essentially what I'm showing is a uh, nucleotide in a strand of DNA, and I'm only showing one nucleotide. I'm not showing the, the one that would be over here. What well, I could put that, I could put that guy over here. So this would be the complementary nucleotide in the other strand. So here's one phosphate group. Here's the five prime carbon, four prime, three prime here, two prime, one prime. Now here's the other phosphate group. So we have two phosphodiester linkages, one on each side of this nucleotide. Now, when, when the cell needs to remove a modified base, what it does is it breaks, it has a, a bunch of different enzymes. So eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells have some of these too. So we'll go over some of these in, in a moment, but humans have a lot of what we're gonna call uh, DNA N-glycosylases. And what they do is that they will remove this modified base. So let's say this is a modified base, is they can recognize a modified base within DNA. And what they do is they break, they can break this bond. And this bond is called an N-glycosidic bond. A glycosidic bond is a bond between a sugar molecule right here. This is our, our ribose and uh, any other compound. So that's a glycosidic bond. This is called a an N-glycosidic bond because the sugar molecule is bound to a nitrogen. So it's always bound to a nitrogen in the nitrogenous base. So this is specifically referred to as a, an N-glycosidic bond. And these enzymes called DNA glycosylases, what they do is they remove the base by, by breaking this bond right here. So let me go over some of these DNA N glycosylases, at least some that are in humans. And humans have many of these types of enzymes because N glycosylases, DNA N glycosylases, okay, in humans. Let's look at a few of these. 
So UNG, what this, what does this do? This recognizes uracil, so it removes uracils in DNA. We have TDG, which removes thymines. Why would we want to remove thymines? Well, if the thymine is in a TG pair, well, TDG, so this is a mismatch, TDG will recognize this and it will remove the T. So UDG2, this is another one that removes uracils. Smug1 also removes uracils. So we have a lot of enzymes that are recognizing uracils in the DNA in various contexts. So MPG is another N uh, DNA and glycosylase, which removes methylated adenines and guanines. So methyl groups at inappropriate places on the adenine or guanine will be recognized by this enzyme called MG MPG. And then we have NTH1, and this removes uh, thymine glycol and cytosine glycols. So all these types of modified bases and mismatches can cause problems in the DNA and these enzymes are, are specific for certain modified bases and then there are many more that you know I'm not going to list. I just want you to get a feel for you know there are specific enzymes encoded by cells that recognize uh, problem bases, certain modifications, and those enzymes are important for removing those bases from the DNA. And uh, again, the general class is called DNA N glycosylase. And the process for removing those bases and replacing them with the correct base is called base excision repair, also abbreviated as BER. Now, I'm going on 12 hours now, so I'm cheating a little bit. And using some diagrams I already put together. So what I'm diagramming here is the, the um, most, I should say, uh, favored model for how the majority of DNA and glycosylases work. So let's say we're looking at, and I'm gonna try and use a, a different diagram for our DNA than what we're used to. So in this diagram, we have the two strands, one up here, one down here, and this one is going from five prime to three prime, so you can see the fives and the threes. These represent the ribose sugars, these squares, and these bonds represent the phosphodiester linkages, and these are the nitrogenous bases. Now you can see we have a, a uracil in the DNA here. So this uracil is gonna have to be removed. And so here in orange, I have diagrammed a uh, DNA and glycosylase. Glycosylase. Now the preferred model of how these enzymes work, or most of them work, is that what they do is they pinch the DNA in such a way that if this is a glycosylase that recognizes U and UG base pairs, it'll cause that U to flip up into an active site on the glycosylase. And when that flips up into the active site, it will uh, cleave that glycosidic bond and remove that U. So that's the general uh, base flipping mechanism of a DNA uh, glycosylase. However, if you've read through the notes, you know the process is slightly more complicated than that. Um, well, not uh, slightly more complicated because there are different types of N glycosylases. So there are some that we call pure N-glycosylases and some that are going to be, that we're going to call N-glycosylases with lyase activity. 
And this lyase activity essentially means that this N-glycosylase is going to break the glycosidic bond, but it's also going to put a uh, break within the ribose sugar itself. So let's take a look at what that means exactly. Uh, again, I have some diagrams here for you. So if we're starting, if we're starting with this diagram here, where the glycosylase has you know, flipped up the U, removed the U, so the pure, so the pure N-glycosylase would remove that U and leave that A basic site. So now this is a site that's lacking a nitrogenous base. The five prime, I mean the, the five carbon sugar is still there. We're just there's no base here. So if the glycosylase has a lyase activity, what it does is it removes the base, but it also breaks the sugar in a way that disconnects it from the phosphodiester uh, backbone, but not, it doesn't disconnect it from the preceding uh, ribose sugar in that DNA strand. So you can see we have this, we have this broken ribose sugar here hanging on right here. So this looks very different, right? There's no nitrogenous base in both cases, but the phosphodiester backbone is intact here. And here no, it's no longer intact. And this is, you know, this is not really, a, it's not a, um, a traditional five carbon sugar with a ring form anymore. It's, it's just has some funny structure. Um, Okay, so now we have two different potential structures that uh, need to be repaired through slightly different pathways. So what I'm going to do is take a look. Okay, so, so we're starting here. Now the next step is going to be, is going to require, so so this right here is the pure glycosylase. This right here is the result of an N-glycosylase. The next step is, uh, requires an enzyme called uh, AP endonuclease. So AP endonuclease will be required next. And what this AP stands for is apurinic or apyrimidinic. So essentially it's an endonuclease that cuts uh, the phosphodiester backbone when DNA lacks a base. So the AP endonuclease, what it will do for starting from here, let me get rid of this guy right here. So these are the structures after the pure glycosylase or the glycosylase with the lyase. The AP endonuclease will cut here and here. So in each case, same enzyme doing the same thing as cutting here or here, which is going to give us these different products right here. So in this one, where we just broke the phosphodiester backbone, we have this loose sugar up here. Down here, we have nothing. So we just have a, a gap right here. So you can see this one's gonna be easier to fix than this one up here. So after that, after the AP endonuclease comes in, the next thing we are going to need is DNA polymerase beta. So this is another DNA polymerase in eukaryotes that we haven't really talked about yet, right? So DNA polymerase beta, what it's gonna do is it's gonna use this three prime OH in both cases, and it's going to add, and it's gonna use this G down here as the template, and it's gonna add a C nucleotide. So we're going to end up with this C nucleotide. Okay, we added a nucleotide, added a nucleotide here. Now, okay, this one, we're essentially done, right? So at this point in the course, you see a hydroxyl group next to a phosphate 
you can probably predict what enzyme we're going to need next, right? We're going to need DNA ligase. It's going to seal that nick, and then, okay, this has been repaired down here. However, up here, you know, we still have this extra ribose sugar up here with a phosphate group. So this needs to be removed. It turns out in recent years, scientists figured out that DNA polymerase beta has a uh, phosphorylase, a, a ribose, what's it called? Deoxyribose phosphorylase activity, which essentially means it can cut this out. So there's one more step needed for up here, which is the DNA polymerase beta uses its deoxyribose phosphorylase activity to remove that phosphorylated ribose there and give us this nick right here. Okay, DNA ligase comes in, seals those up, and okay, so we've repaired, we've repaired this, uh, well, we've, we've taken that U out of, let me go back to the original figure. Where were we? Um, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Sorry, everyone. Okay, we've taken this U out and we've replaced it with a C using either a glycosylase, a pure glycosylase, or a glycosylase that has a lyase activity. Now, one more thing, because you know nothing can ever be simple. And I hope, I hope you understood that as I'm going through it. I'm like, oh man, I've just been here all day. Uh, maybe I should have went through one activity. I mean, one, the, the pure glycosylase first, and then the glycosylase with lyase activity second. But on the other hand, seeing it side by side might help you appreciate the difference. So I'm not sure which one would have worked better, but I'm gonna keep going. So just a couple more things. Both of those mechanisms we went over are called the short patch, or referred to short patch base excision repair mechanisms. Why are they called short patch? Because one base was removed, right? One base removed, one base was uh, synthesized or inserted. So this is a relatively short patch um, uh, during the repair process. A, a short patch uh, needed to be filled, we could say. So there is also a long patch mechanism. So the long patch mechanism occurs, is thought to occur sometimes in humans. So sometimes in humans, uh, the current consensus is that humans and human cells, it's usually the short patch that is used. Long patch is sometimes used. Uh, long patch is preferred in yeast. So in studies of yeast, that's where we, we know most of our molecular mechanisms. So, um, but however, yeast prefers the long patch Humans prefer the short patch mechanism, but humans can use the long patch mechanism. And so we'll take a look at how that works. And it should be kind of easy because it's, it involves some of the enzymes involved in DNA replication. So let's go back to this original problem where we had a U that was in here whether or not, whether this is removed by a glycosylase, uh, a pure glycosylase, or a glycosylase with lye activity doesn't really matter. I went with the pure glycosylase here. So after the glycosylase removes the base, after the AP endonuclease comes in to uh, remove or, or break that phosphodiester bond, between those two sugar molecules. Now, at this point in the long patch mechanism, what happens is DNA polymerase delta or epsilon, I'm gonna put an E for epsilon, come in. Now these are the DNA polymerases involved in replication, right? Alpha two, but 
delta and epsilon are thought to be those that are involved in the long patch mechanism. They come in, and what they do is they use this 3' hydroxyl to start synthesizing DNA. And as they're synthesizing the DNA, what they do is they wedge themselves in. Or right here, they're going to wedge themselves in here. Well, not there, down here like that. And they're going to dislodge a little flap, right? So here we're showing, I'm showing you the flap that's been dislodged. We have this, we have this uh, ribose up here with the other nitrogenous base. And then we're dislodging this T. And then I'm putting some more bases in here. We dislodged a C, another C, and then we're, we're still connected right here. So this is just like how Okazaki fragment maturation is thought to work in eukaryotes with DNA polymerase delta, right? It, it wedges itself into that RNA primer, dislodges the flap, and then what comes in? Phen1, the flap endonuclease, and that cuts the flap, and what that leaves is a phosphodiester uh, or a phospho group, phosphate group on this sugar molecule right here. We have our phosphate group and a hydroxyl group here. What can happen? Ligase comes in and seals that nick. So essentially the long patch mechanism, DNA polymerase delta and L, uh, or epsilon come in, they start synthesizing DNA using this three prime hydroxyl. They keep going, wedging themselves between the nucleotides of the double-stranded segment of the DNA, and they go for anywhere from two to 10 nucleotides, it's thought, creating a flap that is removed by FEN1. This is an enzyme that's also involved in DNA re replication. FEN1 removes the flap, and then DNA ligase comes in and seals the nick. Okay, that's the long patch mechanism. Not too confusing. I hope you understood that. Um, and if I'm going too fast, I recommend pausing the video and taking a look at the diagrams and try to figure out where I'm going with these different things. I diagrammed these sugars in red just to show you that these are the new ones that were made by DNA polymerase delta or epsilon. So I'm gonna end with one more thing. I, uh, what I'm trying to do with this course, I've only taught this course, uh, I think one, maybe twice before. And so the course is still under development and I'm, I, I try to uh, connect everything we do in the course to some sort of human disease or genetic disorder or or something something other than just the, the mechanisms. So there was a recent paper by Groleman et al. Uh, this is journals called uh, Cancer Cell. So it's a very prestigious journal specific for cancer and what they studied is well they looked at humans who have biallelic mutations in the DNA glycosylase NTH1 so biallelic mutations and what does biallelic mutation means essentially humans are diploid right so for all of our chromosomes except for the sex chromosomes in males uh, we have one of each uh, chromosome, so we have one of each gene, so a biallelic uh, mutation is an individual that has mutations in both of his or her uh, NTH1 alleles. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, a person with biallelic mutations has both of their alleles of NTH1 mutated. So uh, NTH1, again, if you look pre, uh, earlier in the video, I mentioned it, it removes thymine glycols and cytosine glycols from DNA. And okay, so what they found was that individuals with biallelic mutations in NTH1 had pre, uh, were predisposed to many different types of cancers. So, and again, you most of you are seniors, so you probably know this by now, but so mutations in genes uh, controlling the cell cycle. Let's say you have mutations in genes controlling the cell cycle. When that happens, cell growth becomes uncontrolled, right? And cells just keep going through the cell cycle. Um, dividing over and over and over again. And that's essentially cancer, 
right? So when the cell cycle becomes uncontrolled and the cells start growing out of control, well, that's essentially how cancer occurs. And the cells have many genes that are supposed to keep this from happening. They're supposed to keep the cell cycle under control. But if you have mutations in those genes, then the cell cycle can get out of control. So NTH1 as an DNA glycosylase, one can predict if we were to lose our copies of NTH1, both of our, our copies of the NTH1 gene, that mutation rates of all of our genes would tend to go up, which increases the chance that genes controlling the sense increases the chance of cancer. At least this is the, the hypothesis that we usually use when individuals who have mutations in genes that are needed to control um, repair DNA, um, why they, they would tend to lead to an increase in uh, or, or predisposition to cancer. So let me just highlight some of their data right here, essentially, and I put the link to the paper in the lecture notes. So essentially what they looked at is they looked at many different types of cancer. So we got colon cancer, we got breast cancer, brain tumors, and pancreatic cancer. Just a couple that I picked out. There were some cancers that, you know, I wouldn't don't really know what types of cancers they are without some more research. And like I said, I've been here for a while, uh, like 12 hours today. So got to get finished with this video. NTH1 minus. So these are patients who have, uh, who have lost both of their copies of NTH1. And then this, these are people from the general population. So cancer patients just from the general population, we don't know what their status for the NTH1 gene is. They could be biallelic mutants, so they, they probably aren't. There's many other, other ways, uh, mutations that can lead to cancer. Um, essentially, average age for colon cancer in NTH1 minus individuals was 61. Over here in the general population, 67. Average age for breast cancer was 48.5 in NTH1 minus individuals, 62 in the general population. Brain tumors, 47. Over here, general population, 58. 58 years old was the average. Pancreatic cancer, this one was relatively low compared to 47 for the NTH1 minus individuals versus 70 for individuals in the general population. So you can look at the others, but there definitely is a correlation. There definitely, to me, it seems to be a, a correlation between predisposition to many different types of cancers and uh, lacking functional copies of the NTH1 gene. Uh, so to me, this seems to suggest that base excision repair is a very important process to um, repairing DNA and very important for uh, decreasing the chance of, of us developing cancer.